Father, we pray today for Pastor Sam and for Jan, just that they would have a good vacation, a good time of rest. And we look forward to having them back together with us soon. We pray for us who are both gathered here and those who are gathered online, uh, that, uh, that our, our focus, our thoughts would be on your word. I pray that you would help me remember what I studied, but I only pray that because I don't want anything to get in the way of the scriptures. And so thank you, Lord, for the truth, for the scriptures that we have it written down, that we can read it every single day, and we give you thanks and praise. Thank you that our salvation is by faith alone. It's not based on human effort. It's based on what you did, and we believe that. So we ask your help today. Pray in Jesus' strong name. We pray in it because we love him. Amen. So five times, just a minute ago, you sang, my my safe place, my righteousness, God, I need you. So my question is, first of all, it's just a minor thing, is I hope when you sing, I happen to love that song, right? My defense, my righteousness, oh Lord, how I need you. I love that song. I asked Pastor John to sing it uh, specifically for this morning. But I hope that you not only sing with your heart and your voice, but your mind. Right, Because when you sing that song, you should be asking yourself the question, well, what's my defense? On what is my righteousness based? Lord, I need you. And I hope you sing with your mind as well as your voice. And so my question today is, okay, you're going to stand before the Lord someday and you're going to give an account and you're going to declare that you love him. And he's going to say, by the way, what's your defense on what is your righteousness based? And the message this morning is about a righteousness by faith alone. And then we'll see one consequence that leads to it, adoption. Justification by faith alone. Now, you can't help but study that subject, but you end up in, in the book of Genesis, believe it or not, because it is there, in the very first place, it's mentioned that our righteousness is by faith. God declares us righteous by faith alone. And so we have the story of Abraham, chapter 15. He's, he's, uh, there's this miracle baby that is to, is to come, right? He's 99, she's past menopause. They cannot have children, and yet Isaac is born to them. And Isaac was a child of promise, right? Chapter 15, God said, your kids are gonna be like the stars of the sky, the, the sand of the shore. That's how many kids you're gonna have through Isaac. Well, then you come to chapter 22, and Abraham and Isaac go up into a high place that God picks out, and there Abraham is to offer Isaac, his only son, the son of promise, he is to offer him as a sacrifice to the Lord. And in Genesis 22 and verse 5, Abraham makes what I take to be one of the great faith statements of all the Bible. He said, we will go and worship, and we will come back to you. That is, my son and I will go up to the mountain, I'm going to sacrifice him, and then we're going to come back. How could that be? Well, it's simple. Because he believed that God would raise even the dead, even Isaac, if it was necessary to keep his promise. You see, Abraham is held out to us as an example, number one, exhibit A of justification, righteousness that comes through faith and faith alone. And of course, God didn't uh, require that of him. And, and so uh, I, I would like you to look at, at uh, Hebrews chapter 11, because there in ver, uh, verse 17, 18, and 19, 
Abraham is, it's, it's understood, and the writer of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says that. Hebrews 11, 7 through 19. By faith, Abraham, when tested of God, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. And Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a sense or in a manner, in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. You see, Abraham believed in God. He believed God would keep his promises no matter what. And isn't that, in essence, the gospel, that we believe in Jesus Christ, that he died for us, and that our hope is in him no matter what? So the Apostle Paul, referring to this very same uh, incident, occur, recurs, uh, excuse me, tells us in chapter 4 of Romans, here's what Paul writes. Yet he, that is Abraham, did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. That is why it was credited to, hit, to him as righteousness. The words, it was credited to him, were not written for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins, and was raised to life for our justification. So the Apostle Paul, the writer of the book of Hebrews, declares over and over, our righteousness before God Almighty, who is altogether holy and altogether sinless and altogether righteous, our righteousness is based on faith. And so... Uh, repeated twice in this very passage, it says it was credited. Now, that's a legal term. Um, you kind of need to divorce yourself just a little bit, put us in a courtroom setting. We, as we appear before a judge. I have a good friend. Uh, his name is Pat. He's a retired judge. So let's pretend for a moment that I did something that was horribly, horribly wrong. Um, pick something. Let's say I murdered somebody. And I appear before a judge. I appear before him, Pat. And Pat has every re reason before the law to declare me guilty. I am guilty as can be. And yet he says, somebody has paid the price. Somebody who was innocent became guilty for your sake. And he declares me righteous in the sight of the law. Now, I'm going to ask you to make a little distinction here, right? It's not just that I'm declared righteous. You can use the word credited or accounted, or if you're a theologian, you can use the word imputed. But the bottom line is, God credits me with righteousness that is not my own. And, and here's the distinction, and, and this may be slicing it too fine for you, I don't know. The Bible does not say that I am made righteous. You say, well, big difference, what's the difference? Made righteous, declared righteous. And I would argue that there's a huge difference if I stood before the judge and he made me righteous, well, that's, that would be good for that offense, right? Until I sinned again, till I offended again. And then I would need to be declared righteous or made righteous all over again. And, and that is why in, in in, in one branch of religion, Christ is offered as a sacrifice in every service, and he is, he is sacrificed again so that you can be saved again. And I think declaration or imputation or God's accounting to us as righteous is incredibly important. 
Now, I have here for you a, a little bit of a definition. Follow along on the screen. Justification by faith, by faith alone, is the act of God in bringing sinners into a right relationship with himself through forgiveness of sins. It is a declarative act of God by which he establishes persons as righteous, that is, in right and true relationship to himself. Okay, let me, let me say it one more time. Justification by faith alone is the act of God in bringing sinners into a right relationship with himself through forgiveness of sins. It is the declarative act of God by which he establishes persons as righteous, that is, in right and true relationship with himself. Now, that's a long definition. I understand that. But I think it's terribly important. And, and I, uh, it's hard for me to even believe this, but it's true in history. Uh, 500 years ago at the Reformation, people died for this truth. And we just kind of, you know, we, we can just pass on by and I throw out a definition and you follow it along and people died for the truth. They paid with their lives with the truth that Jesus died for them and their faith was alone, was needed for salvation. It is the gracious act of God. Um, I think you have to just go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 and Adam and Eve sin and God acts on their behalf, right? He seeks them out. He engages them in conversation. He, he convicts them of their sin. And then finally, at the end of chapter 3, uh, God uh, sacrifices animals to cover their sin. God always takes in the initiative. That's what justification by faith means. It means he brings sinners. And that, that includes all of us. In fact, we would, but to go to Romans 1, 2, and 3, and, and there it's declared that we're all sinners. Every one of us brings us into a right relationship with himself. And, and I kind of I was thinking this week, I thought, you know, our tendency, and, and certainly is mine, our tendency to, when we talk about salvation, is to we focus on one part. And we could focus on justification by faith alone. We could talk about sanctification. We could talk about election. We could talk about predestination. We could talk about sealing. We could talk about calling. And aren't those all kind of under the umbrella of salvation? Salvation is such a wonderful word. It, it encompasses all of those and even more. And so it is the act, the gracious act, of God, by which he brings sinners, you and me, into a right relationship with himself. Through forgiveness, past, present, future. And it's not by works. I've done a fair amount of thinking about this. Why am I a Christian? And I think there's lots of reasons. But one of the reasons is really simple. When you boil it all down, when you study a variety of religions, when you look at the history of the world, there are two, that's three, two religious systems in the world, right? There are two ways to get saved according to man and according to the religious world. One is through human effort, through good works, through nice deeds, through offering sacrifices, through a variety of offerings. It's through human effort. And the one, and the only one, is Christianity. That teaches, it's not my effort, it's God's effort on my behalf. And that's why I believe. Because I know me well enough. I know I've sinned, I know I'm going to sin again. And, and no matter how much I, I try and no matter how hard I work and how, how much good I do, I know it's not enough. My only hope is not my effort. It's that God's effort towards me is enough. 
So Galatians chapter 2 says this. Know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in, Christ, in Jesus Christ. So we too have put on our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. How much clearer could it possibly be? By the works of the law, by our human effort, no one will be justified in God's sight. That, that's the bottom line, right? So, one of the results of that is we have peace with God. Romans chapter 5 says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. God and I are not at war anymore. Amen to that. God's not mad anymore. My sin has not separated me from Him anymore. Praise His name. I have peace with God. And there comes moments in our lives when, when, when we have to decide, do we have peace with God or not? About 12 days ago or so, um, Connie was in the hospital up in Caldwell, Idaho. Um, a very, very, very bad night. Um, she thought she was going to die. And it's not the first time. But she thought she was going to die. And at that moment, you decide really quickly, do you have peace with God or not? And she decided, I have peace with God. Now, she still went through a lot of suffering and, and the, you know, and she's still improving and, and, you know, it's not over yet. But the bottom line is she had peace with God. And so... Your question probably is, okay, I have peace with God through justification by faith alone. Well, what's the nature of good works? What's, what's with good works? Right? Because it's all through the, the scriptures. And, and the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 3, where then is boasting? It's, inclu it's excluded because of, of what law? The law that requires works? No. No because of the law that requires faith. For we, we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Again, crystal clear, right? We are not, we are not saved by good works. The problem all too often is in James, because it seems as if James takes one view and Paul takes another view, because James writes... Someone says, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe there's one God? Good. I, even the demons believe that. They shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is dead or useless? Dead occurs a little bit later on in the chapter. And so you have the Apostle Paul says, by the works of the law shall no one be justified. And you have James who's saying without, without works, no one is justified. Who's right? The answer is they're both right. Right? Paul writes to a, a group of people who believe that by good works, they could earn their salvation. James writes to a group of people who believe that they could live any way they pleased. They don't, they don't follow any law, any commands, any deeds at all. And so he writes, if your faith is not for real, if it doesn't show up on a day-to-day -day basis, that's not faith at all. The two don't disagree. The scriptures don't disagree. They're just written to two different audiences. And so that leads us to a second truth. And this truth, um, because... I, Justification by faith alone, it's a legal term. It's a forensic, that is legal, term. It could be construed as a little bit cold. God makes a legal decision on our behalf. 
And let me tell you that that's not the way the scriptures present it. But sometimes that's even how we might take it. And I want to tell you that this truth of adoption blows that theory completely out of the water. That God doesn't care, that God doesn't love, that God doesn't want. And so we're left with the, the, the truth, the teaching of adoption. Now, adoption is not a new thought to you or to me. Um, I asked Pastor Sam for permission to tell. I don't use anybody as an illustration without asking their permission. I learned that a hard way from three boys. And um, I asked Pastor Sam if I could mention to, to you all, he is adopted. And he has nothing but good and wonderful and appreciative things to say about his parents. And, and the, the, the husband and wife who adopted him, he speaks so kindly and appreciatively about them. And, and when adoption works, I can't think of a better example of God's love, right? When it works, sometimes it doesn't work. And I understand that. And humanly speaking, it should work, but sometimes it doesn't. But I'm here to tell you this morning that God, in God's way, God's word, God's will, adoption always works, right? He doesn't make mistakes. And so we have in Galatians chapter four, verse three to seven, if so, when we were under age, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when, you, but when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that, he might receive, that we might receive adoption to sonship because you are his sons. God sent his spirit as, excuse me, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. And there's adoption at its finest. Because of that adoption, we're allowed to call God the Father, Abba. It's Aramaic. Uh, probably would translate it something like Daddy, although that seems almost too familiar sometimes for me. Um, I, don't, I hope this is progress uh, in, in my growth, but, but when I was an early Christian and a new Christian, I could not use the word just Jesus. I, could always, I would always refer to Jesus Christ or the Lord Jesus. Um, Jesus just seemed so familiar to me. Now, I hope I've grown. I use his name personally, lovingly, respectfully. I have no trouble at all referring to just Jesus. But the bottom line is, he, with, in all his glory, has adopted us. And because of him, I am able to call God the Father, Abba, Father. And so, here's another definition. I know this morning's loaded with them. Here's another definition for you. This one's shorter, though. Adoption is the legal process of the taking of another's child and lovingly, lovingly, bringing up, lovingly bringing it up as your own. It's the legally taking of another's child and lovingly bringing it up as your own. Adoption, what a perfect, perfect picture of the relationship between the believer and God the Father. And so um, I just jotted down a few things about adoption. Number one, uh, we're wanted. Now somebody made a decision for an adoption to take place. God chose us. And, and I have some uh, dear, dear friends who went to an orphanage in another country and they went through the whole orphanage and they picked out one child and they adopted him. He chose us. He chose you. He ch and you are a full son or daughter. 
right? God doesn't have any stepchildren. Now, many of us grew up in homes of divorce or um, perhaps our parents are remarried. And so we're stepchildren. But God doesn't have any stepchildren. We're full sons and full daughters. And we're loved, right? By definition, if there's anything that shows the love of God, it's got to be adoption. And finally, we're cared for. Our needs are met both spiritually and physically and financially and mentally because God takes care of his kids. Now, I want to be crystal, crystal clear. Adoption in the Apostle Paul, his world, adoption was something that, that, that sons Sons were taken advantage of, right? Sons, you adopted sons. Women weren't adopted in the ancient Near East. They weren't adopted in the Roman culture or the Greek culture. And yet, and I'll read you some scripture in just a moment. God has chosen us, but he has chosen men and he has chosen women. The Apostle Paul uses the word sonship, adoption to sonship. And it would be easy for you women to think, well, uh, maybe that doesn't include me. And I'm here to tell you that God is absolutely, has always been, but Old Testament and especially in the New, he is revolutionary. He is countercultural because men and women are treated with equal dignity and equal respect. Women... Uh, New Testament women who are Christians would read this passage and say, oh my goodness, I'm adopted too. And so you understand when Paul talks about adoption to sonship, he's referring to both men and women because God values both equally. So um, I have a, a scripture for you, Romans chapter 8, and here's verse 14. And I want you to listen very carefully to the words of inclusion, right? Talks about children. It talks about um, heirs. Uh, it talks about both of us together. Let me read Romans 8. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you look in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. And the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. And then Paul goes on to talk about his present sufferings being of insignificance. But did you hear this inclusive language? Children. Uh, in verse 12 of this chapter, it talks about sons, or excuse me, it talks about brothers and sisters. So in salvation, we are treated equally. Now, I want you to look at yeah, just one last passage with me. Ephesians chapter 1. And I want you to think about this in terms of adoption. Ephesians 1 verse 4 to 8. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonships, sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Verse 4, he chose us. Also in verse 4, he changed us. We're holy and blameless. Verse 5, Excuse me, also in verse 4 is he loves us. Verse 5, he adopted us. Verse 6, he is freely gracious to us. Verse 7, he redeemed us. Verse 8, he lavished on us. 
You see why adoption is just such a perfect picture of the relationship between the child of God and God the Father? So, here's a few, here's a few takeaways. And I want you to just kind of sit back now and like me and just relax a little bit because here's what I have to say to you. Number one, God wanted you. I'm not talking to the person to your left or to your right or the person in front of you or behind you. I'm just talking to you. God wanted you. And, and man, we should just stop and let that sit and soak for a minute. The God of this universe wanted you. Talk about blow your mind. He wants you. And God chose you. He chose you. Out of all the people in the world, people who, quite frankly, are better than you and more special than you and nicer than you, and he chose you. He wants you. He chose you. And he chose you to be a full son or a full daughter. There aren't levels of Christians. Those who are really, really blessed and those who are not. He wanted you. He chose you. You are a son or a daughter of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen? And here, here's one that's just, <laughs> it just gets me. God loves you. He loves you. You. And we, we've gotten so accustomed to that word and it's so casual in our culture. Love means affection or best wishes or something. And yet the Bible takes that word and infuses it, agape, with such meaning. There was, there was four words in that culture that the writers of Scripture could have chosen to speak of God's love, His abiding care and love for you. Could have chosen the word for family love, but He didn't. Could have chosen the word for brotherly love. It's used, but that's not the word that's used in, uh, for Christians. Could have chosen the word for romantic love. Didn't choose a little known, a, a little bit, a little known word called agape, and infused it with the meaning of the cross, because you can hardly find the word agape without in that paragraph somewhere finding the work of Jesus on the cross, and so love wasn't just some generic affection for you. It was God specifically working on your behalf through Jesus on the cross. Agape cannot be separated from the cross. And oh, how he loves, to borrow the words of an old hymn, you and me. And then finally, you are an heir with Jesus Christ. Now, I have to admit that I've never really studied that very much. I don't really know that I fully understand what it means to be an heir, or literally, in Paul's words, a co-heir with Christ. I don't know that. So one of the beauties of being retired is I get to study whatever I want. Sunday doesn't come two or three times a week like it used to. And so I get to study what I want. So my and your heirship, is that a word? You and my being heirs with Christ, it's in the queue, right? <laughs> I'm going to study it. It's not first or second. Actually, I want to study uh, really, really bad. I want to study uh, Romans 13 and, and uh, 
and 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 First Peter talks about submission to government, but that's a whole nother subject, right? But I'm going to study what does it mean to be an heir of Christ, because I want to know, because that's what God has promised for me in His Son. And so, if you're a child of God, that is, if you have ju been justified by faith alone, and, and you are a part of his family, you've been wanted, you've been chosen, you're a full child, you are loved. Um, and so here's my invitation to you. I bet you got this one memorized. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then the next verse says, and whoever has believed, not condemned. Have you believed? I don't mean just have you, by strength of effort and human will, have you just let go and let God have you let Him be your Savior because you can't do it yourself? Oh boy. We're His child by faith. By faith alone. And I would say with the hymn, Oh, oh, how He loves you and me. Let's pray. Father, thank You very much for the truth of justification by faith alone. There is within us, even as Christians, this, this need, uh, wrongly I know, but this desire to somehow do good and maybe in some way earn your favor, your approval. And, and Lord, if there's a truth that puts that to rest, it is this, that we are justified by faith alone. And it is only by believing in Jesus that we have the hope of the good news. And my prayer today is that any man or woman or child in, in the hearing of my voice who has not made that decision to believe on you, that they would do that now. That they would put their hope and trust in you and you alone for their salvation. That they would trust in the promise of God that, that Jesus on the cross, he died for us. It was enough, more than enough. And I would pray for them. I pray for us as Christians that we would not keep yearning and earning and striving, but we would relax and we would rest in the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And we would be people who are motivated, not by, not, not by works, but people who are motivated to do good works and good deeds and good things, because it only makes sense for people like us who've been saved by faith. And so, Father, I pray that in this week that lies before us, that stretches unknown ahead of us, that Jesus would be honored and glorified in all that we do and all that we say. And we ask this because of him, in whose name we pray. Amen.